Okay, we're going to have a little chat in this heart cafe uh, here this morning. Um, and uh, we thank Novartis and Nova. So my name is Professor Julie Redfern. For those of you that are here, thanks for coming. And uh, I'm from uh, Sydney, Australia, recently moved to Queensland. And uh, I'll ask each of our speakers to introduce themselves. We're talking about um, atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease, prevention and care, um, with a bit of a focus on the, the sort of Asia-Pacific region, I think. So I'll ask you each to introduce yourself, and then I've got some questions, and we'll, we'll have a chat. Do you want to go first, Angela? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Angela Cole, uh, Associate Professor from um, National Heart Centre, Singapore, and also a faculty at the Duke NUS Medical School. Um, I'm a physician scientist, uh, and my research areas has been in population health as well as uh, aging uh, in, and CVD in older adults. Happy to be here today. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Michael. I'm from Singapore. Uh, I'm currently the chair for cardiology in the Academy of Medicine in Singapore. So, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jasper Trump. I'm an assistant professor of public health in Singapore. I'm originally from Holland, so I'm not Singaporean, but living there for eight years. Uh, and I do a lot of work in prevention of CVD in the region, so countries like Laos or Cambodia, uh, but also in Singapore. Now, are you an emerging leader, Jasper? Yes, I was. Yeah. So for those that don't know, a few of us here, Angela, three, myself, three and us, Jasper, so. are all previous emerging leaders that have emerged from the World Heart Federation Emerging Leader Program. So have a look at that on the website. But um, And Jasper and I also work together on the Digital Health Roadmap. Yes. So that's very exciting. Very true. Okay, so I'm going to go to you first, Jasper. Yeah. So I've got a question here for you. Um, you've worked on comparing cardiovascular disease patterns across different countries in Asia. Um, and you're also looking at differences in healthcare systems um, to deal with, with cardiovascular disease. But what can you tell us about some of these variations in the region? Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Um, I mean, I think we've worked with very large registries across the region in Asia. A lot of it has been in heart failure. I'll speak a bit closer to the mic. Um, I, I, you know, I think the interesting thing about, um, uh, especially when you look at these registries for heart failure, is that Asia is so extremely di diverse. Like we have uh, in Japan, the oldest patients in the world with heart failure when, at the moment when they develop heart failure. And we also have among the youngest in countries like Indonesia or Laos and Cambodia, uh, where they're almost 20 years younger in most of these registries than, for example, in Japan. So there's a really big age difference. Um, Part of that, which I guess what we find uh, explains that difference, is also partially where they are as a country in the epidemiological transition, right? So uh, it's a theory where with greater economic development, um, the disease patterns change, right? And you see in countries like Indonesia, Cambodia, uh, there's still a lot of uh, tobacco smoking that is actually increasing in a lot of these countries. Uh, there are very few... Uh, primary prevention programs from the government. Um, there's very few active uh, primary prevention programs. Arguably, for my own work in Laos and Cambodia, connections between companies like big tobacco, uh, big alcohol, big food, and government is a bit more intimate, I would argue, which makes uh, primary prevention also challenging. Uh, and then the other Part is that, um, especially in the countries in the region that I work, there are, um, I would say, not very well developed primary healthcare systems. So the primary care there is still not uh, built for either prevention or managing of NCDs. And I think that some of these differences, so part of the policies at primary prevention level, but also secondary prevention level at primary care, um, I think partially explain these differences, why we see that uh, uh, in especially Southeast Asia, the patients are a lot younger, uh, develop cardiovascular disease at a younger age. And when you look at heart failure, and I'm going to be very specific, unfortunately also die a lot sooner despite their relative youth. And it has all to do, I think, with, uh, um, you know, the way in the health system, how well it's prepared to take care of these patients and how well it's uh, able to prevent the disease from happening. So what about some successes. You got any examples of anywhere where, where things are working quite well? well or, there's a yeah, lot of could you give us a couple of examples that, no. that you're aware of? There's a lot of examples. I mean, I can give you an example from um, 
uh, food was a good example. Um, well, like I said, Japan is a country, it's an outlier on the other side, right? So Japan are, has among the best outcomes for patients with heart failure globally. And we know this from registries, we know this from trials. Um, you know, part of the things that we see in the data that might explain this is they have a very long length of stay. So this means that the payment by the hospital actually allows patients to stay long and to get up titrated on the medication that they should be getting for heart failure, for example. Um, I think in the region, um, I'm part, very lucky to be part of, um, the Get With The Guidelines Asia. So we're implementing the American Heart Association Get With The Guidelines program in Asia, in countries, uh, uh like Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines. And you see a lot of these quality improvement programs are working in getting patients on the medication that they should be. Um, so I think there's a lot of things going very, very well in the region. Absolutely. Uh, but I think also there's, yeah, room for improvement as well. I mean, I think that's interesting. In a longer length of stay. I mean, in a country like Australia where we live, the pressure is always about reducing the length of stay. So, so that's quite interesting. Just um, on another point, and I mentioned that we were on the Digital Health Roadmap for World Heart Federation together, but um, you've got a strong interest, Jasper, in this area. How important do you think digital health is um, in the area and what are the main challenges and opportunities regarding digital health? Yeah, I think digital health, is, I think, a very sort of major opportunity, um, especially because in a lot of the countries in the region, I think digital health, like apps, decision support tools, allow the health system essentially to leapfrog some of the gaps that are there in, for example, training or in management uh, of patients in, in terms of prevention. And especially because, for example, a country like Laos or Cambodia there's a still a quite a high penetration of, for example, mobile phones that can be used at the health center level to improve management of patients. Um, so the opportunity is there. Um, um, some of my own work, which hopefully you can see later on when I'm presenting at around 2.30, 2:30. In this room back here, uh, deals with, with electric, uh, electronic decision support tools using deep learning for ultrasound, where we can get novices to perform cardiac ultrasound after a day of training. Um, you know, using deep learning support for image acquisition and interpretation. So the point is, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, the barriers, again, are, and because I wear a public health hat rather than a cardiology hat, are in the health system level. Yeah. Uh, reimbursement for these technologies is extremely challenging, especially when they open up new models of care. Imagine that traditionally an echo is done by a cardiologist or a sonographer in a secondary or tertiary referral center. With these new interventions, we're able to move, for example, echocardiography to the primary care level or in the hands of community health workers or nurses. But this needs to be reimbursed and it's a new form of, of care that is actually a lot cheaper based on cost effectiveness analysis that we've done, but then still needs the push from the ministries of health to recognize that this exists, it needs to be paid for, and one of the challenges here, I would also say, is that it needs to be properly evaluated. So you need a proper, what we call health technology assessment, so cost effectiveness analysis, et cetera, that would support implementation of these kind of technologies. I think the barriers are really here because policy moves a lot slower than the development of the technologies, unfortunately. And do you think in the region, um, is there sort of good support for, for digital technologies around the funding and pri from private insurers or, or the public system? Or, I mean, I'm not familiar with, with the region that you're working, so it's interesting to hear that because it's quite a forward, aggressive region, really. I mean, I, I think colleagues that, that work in country are, are a lot better poised to speak to, the, to, to this than me, but maybe a little bit from my own experience. Um, you know, there are friends here that I've worked with from uh, uh, CCDC, Professor Prabhakaran. They have been extremely progressive, I would say, in implementing telehealth solutions, digital health solutions, which they're going to talk about also at 2.30. Uh, as an example of, of I think, in, in, in India, where they're extremely progressive. In Thailand, there's been moves um, um, to, to implement, for example, uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy screening using deep learning, but they're now moving to, to look at reimbursement in telehealth. So I would say Thailand is moving quickly. Singapore, I'm yeah. going to apply for PR soon, so I'm blowing Singapore's horn a little bit. Uh, uh, Singapore is obviously moving really, really quick, extremely yeah. progressive. I think yeah. Angela can speak to that later. Um, so, so yeah, there is movement, but it's, it's, 
it, it varies a lot, I would argue. So like countries like Cambodia is a bit slower in my experience um, than, for example, yeah, Singapore or India. Yeah. Okay. That's really great. And thanks for those insights. And yes, I'll be speaking at 2.30 as well. So uh, <laughs> come along to that. Okay. So I'm going to move to you now, Angela. So a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first one is, you know, there have been several important recent initiatives in Singapore that you you obviously are aware of and, and are involved with in promoting cardiovascular prevention, um, including the Healthier Heart SG. Now, I don't know what the Healthier Heart SG stands for, but I'm hoping you're going to share that with us. So can you tell us a little bit about All right. some of these initiatives? Yeah. Thank you, Julie. And um, absolutely right. Um, I think before we go into the term called Healthier Heart SG, it really came from a national-wide um, plan called Healthier SG. And the cardiologist basically just inserted a heart in between. But let me tell you about how Healthier SG. Um, it is a transformation, um, one of the biggest uh, move uh, um, by the ministry since healthcare transformation has occurred since 1993. It was launched in uh, 21st September 2022. And basically what that means is a whole of system prioritization uh, away from curative care to preventive care. So that, that, that's the big objective that they want to achieve. Um, and because it's such a massive and ambitious um, proposal, what exactly are the things that's going to be involved? So it's going to be it's going to involve really from a ground up kind of approach. So every resident will be um, advised, encouraged to identify a GP, a general practitioner. Um, I will just share a little bit about how Does the SG stand for Singapore. Ah, uh, that's correct. No. I'm so okay. If... Don't mind me. Oh yes, yeah. catching up on the SG. sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so it's ground up and, um, and what happens is that currently what happens is over the years, GPs have been managing sporadic patients, but they really are, um, the key touch points for which apparently well patients get into contact with a health practitioner. So doing that actually increases the touch points at which apparently well people get screened. So that's one. The second thing really is about um, having health plans. So health plans for specific um, risk factors. And how did this heart come in? This, this heart came in because a lot of the risk factors are actually cardiovascular risk factors. Um, and uh, what had happened was that there was a paper, I believe um, Dr. Michael Lim has, was involved uh, together with the chapter of cardiologists um, and the Singapore Cardiac Society uh, in conjunction with Singapore Heart Foundation was to really use this opportunity to intensify the cardiovascular bit, leveraging on the entire national platform of digital health. Uh, specifically, what's happening on the digital health front is that before every single patient comes to an outpatient appointment, they actually do get a uh, short message system, SMS prompt on their phones. Um, so that's one. And when, when they do that, they actually have an opportunity to input their known or unknown risk factors. And so that, that's a touch point. The second touch point is really to apply evidence-based screening. So it's not just broad brain screening, but really targeted CV uh, estimations based on well-established calculators. So like Framingham risk scores and so forth. So that kind of targets and it is a better strategy to be able to understand each individual's baseline risk and then act from there. Now, the other thing that is really important is uh, patient education. So while a lot of them will receive SMSs and prompts, there is also about misconceptions, fear of being scammed. Should I click on that? Is it going to take over my phone? So these uh, things are also critical to ensuring that these policies actually would work and patients are comfortable, they're confident that it's going to save. So a lot of work will also be necessary to increase confidence, strengthen IT systems, and also access. And access is not just by a phone. I mean, everybody has a phone nowadays. However, um, there is also access to whether, do they want to see a doctor? Because seeing a doctor and getting screened involves um, payment systems, Early detection makes sense from a health practitioner point of view, from a patient point of view. Do I want to pay for that? Maybe I can wait five years later and, you know, and not spend anything five years now. So we've actually actually uh, given grants 
to GPs to get on board. Um, they get subsidies, they get reimbursed, and the first consultation and thereof actually gets highly subsidized. And also, at the same time, recognizing that it is still in its infancy, this entire Healthier Heart SG in line with the National Healthier SG, I think we continue to need to look at feedback from stakeholders, the experience, where the gaps are. Um, and so leveraging on the data that's mounted on all of these apps, digital information, there is actually a national IT system for medical records. So these records actually were very useful for future data analytics and prediction. That's exactly what I was going to ask you. So, I mean, talking about progressive, to me, you know, it's interesting. You think progressive, it's doing prevention, right? I mean, it's a bit sad. We have to kind of almost go backwards to go forward, but how progressive and how fantastic. So that's a whole of country policy with one uh, electronic medical record system. Are people, how are people feeling about that in terms of the government having access to all of their information and the medical, like, is there that fear, you know, that we saw during COVID with people getting worried about this sort of thing? How's the feeling on that space? So while there is um, such a whole uh, nation uh, movement, I think at the end of the day, it's voluntary. They may receive that prompt. It's up to them if they whether they want to click on that link. Um, as of May of this year, I, I believe the enrollment uh, for Healthy SG uh, has been about 37%. It's pretty good. Uh, 2022, I think. Yeah. That's good. You, you guys in there? You enrolled? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that's really fantastic. So I think the, um, you know, that population level uh, awareness and education is, is what the next question is about. But, you know, obviously that's challenging. What, what's the strategies being implemented to sort of get the people on board and get the clinicians on board and get people confident? Is it advertising? Is it what are the sort of public health, population health strategies? Um, so we try to make the best out of the buck. Um, and basically where there are several things that's also happening alongside that, that form that goes online. Uh, what's happening is, uh, over the, over the last couple of years, there has been a healthier, uh, 365 app. So that again is a national app. Yep. Um, and what it tracks is recognizing that chronic disease, it's not just about medications and diabetes, but it's also about physical fitness, fitness trackers, sleep, uh, giving them opportunities to log on to meals, meal logs, and giving advice. And then at the same time, uh, that would also uh, allow other community partners um, involved in lifestyle prevention to actually be able to share free community uh, resources, such as there's an exercise program happening over here in the heartlands where it's free, you can join in. Um, there's a cooking session over there you can do. So it's, it's all of these is really trying to penetrate into the community. Um, and, and the good thing about that app is that it actually partners with private, um, collaborators as well. And it works on most phones. Actually, I would say all phones and depending on which phone you take and which program that phone is used to, it is on the app together. And any insight? I mean, it's a generic. Uh, sort of initiative, but there's the heart version of it or, or add on to it. How do you think the cardiovascular sort of element is going in terms of cardiovascular health? Um, I think uh, I think in terms of where we are looking at uh, how this would come, I, I, my my experience and my patients coming to me for who are who have established cardiovascular disease, yeah. um, they tell me that I want to go to the GP now and not see you. And the reason is because it's cheaper right now. The drugs, because of this program, is actually cheaper to get from the GP than from me. And to me, I think that's a win. Yeah, exactly. A day when we don't need interventional cardiologists is, you know, I guess a, a success for prevention. What did we hear from Jumbo? Three million stents or something or angioplasties or angiograms or something every year here in China? Uh, I mean, that's astronomical. Um Okay, well, that's really helpful. And I mean, I think congratulations to, to anyone here from Singapore. And, uh, I think that's, uh, that's a really progressive model. Is there anyone else here besides you, you guys? <laughs> um, okay. So we'll move along to you, Michael. Um, 
So, you know, again, there's there's sort of been some recent work in Singapore to develop local evidence-based guidelines. So that's, that's the first question for you, uh, including around lipid management, cholesterol lowering. Do you want to speak about this a little bit and, sure. and how these guidelines kind of dovetail into the, the strategy in Singapore? Yeah, so maybe let me give you a little bit of background. So if you look at developed cities or countries like Singapore and you look at the cardiovascular disease trend, uh, I think what you will notice is that although the uh, age standardized mortality rate for AMI is coming down, but actually the age standardized mortality rate for IHD is, is actually trending upwards. Okay. Many of these developed countries. So in Singapore, we saw that after 2013. So while our AMI rates were coming down, but deaths from IHD was actually doing this way. So then we need to ask ourselves, uh, we, we mustn't get complacent. I mean, we get good results, but what else should we be doing to bring that down and stop this trend of going up? Then obviously, uh, part of the reason will be uh, cardiometabolic disease, more affluent uh, countries, people eat more, um, you know. So we looked at the risk factor profile in Singapore, which probably quite reflects many of the developed countries. And we noticed two things that were sort of like climbing up or not in the best of, uh, not optimal. One was lipids. The other one was hypertension. But what was very interesting I, in Singapore is that smoking is down. So we've, we've managed to get smoking down. So I think the ministry wanted to say that, okay, uh, then we need to work on uh, the guidelines because the old guidelines were outdated, 2016. So we, we actually had a guidelines committee. I was, I was chair for the committee for, guide for lipids in Singapore for the academy. And uh, we looked at the different uh, parameters and we work in parallel with the Ministry of Health, which also had a committee. I sat in both committees. So their version was more for the GPs. My Our version was for the GPs and the specialists. But the, the data is all the same. The recommendations are all similar. Yeah. But, you know, the most important thing about guidelines is only as good as a piece of paper if nobody implements the guidelines. So the guidelines were issued in December 2023. So about six months down the road, I started asking around the pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, when you visit the doctors, do they know about the guidelines? And to my horror, most of them were not aware about these guidelines. So, you know, then I told myself that, okay, then we need to do something about it. So uh, we're in the midst of embarking on a large exercise to actually uh, make sure that the GPs aware that the guidelines have been revised, new targets for them to achieve. But not only that, we went to the labs as well. Because when the labs print the results out, they have reference ranges. So all these reference ranges are still the old ranges. So I told the lab, uh, do you, do you, do you need me to drop you a formal note to change? Oh, no, no, it's okay. We, we just need time to change it. So fine. So I think we're trying to put pressure on different segments to make sure that the message gets down to the ground that we want to let the GPs know. And it's not just about a booklet or digital. We're also thinking of how to make it so simple that it's on their table. They will look at it every day. So, so these are things that we are implementing to to make this happen. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to confess, I, I feel really embarrassed. That's not something I've ever thought of before. How you actually change the, you know, the recommended level with the pathology labs? Uh, I don't know why I've never thought of that. But I mean, that's critical, right? Because then the printout goes to the GP or the patient that they sort of over target or under target. So making sure that target is, is the right target is. I mean, that, that's not easy work, um, and I really commend you for doing that. But how did you sort of tackle that? Just start writing to the pathology and the lab? Well, I, I just called them and said, oh, uh, you know, you're aware that the guidelines have been updated. I don't know. Um, yeah. Do you need me to drop you a formal <laughs> message to say that, you know, oh, no, no, we're, we're in the midst of doing it. Just give us a bit of time because, you know, I need to change the software. I said, fine, that's fine. Go ahead, but just make sure you do it. That's all. 
you know, and they're, they're all happy about it. I mean, so simple, but but not necessarily what we immediately think of. And I think commending you again in terms of thinking about implementation. And, um, you know, I know the World Heart Federation is, is going to be doing implementation uh, sort of recommendations alongside the roadmaps now, which I think is actually really important. Um, and, and you did mention hypertension. So I know we were going to so, more so about We've hypertension. actually also come up with a new set of guidelines for hyper. just released very recently last year as well. Uh, but, you know, we, we are cognizant of this trend that's going up and we, we are not complacent. So the Ministry of Health has just formed a national uh, ischemic heart disease strategy work group, uh, which will probably work for the next two years to look at what else can we do to lower this. And some of the very, very interesting findings, I mean, I just shared some very preliminary data is that because sometimes our systems are just too efficient, just too efficient. So we capture data too easily. So if you do a blood test in a public hospital and your troponin is elevated, straight away it goes to the registry. And it's like, okay, this guy, uh, maybe he has either an end STEMI. So the question we are asking ourselves, and we are looking at it ourselves as well, are we over-classifying end STEMI? And what's very interesting in Singapore's case is that if you look at the cohort that's getting AMI or dying from IHD, it's actually the 80 plus. It's not, it's, so the 80 plus segment is getting larger and larger. The younger ones are getting less and lesser. And, you know, you have situations like where this guy has history of IHD, but he's got uh, stage four cancer and he dies. And then the doctor says, no, I will, I will say that he died of, uh, and STEMI. And then that becomes our number. But did he really die of end STEMI? It's a question mark there. So we're looking at delving into the, the specifics of the data to make sure that we get more relevant data so that at least we know whether are we not doing our best or is it because of the way we capture data that's you know causing us to show these numbers as well. So I think that's very important if we really want to implement a program and we want to understand whether the program is effective. I think the data, the quality of the data is how you get the data is very, very important as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's going to come up in our 2.30 session. We didn't plan this, Jasper, but um, yeah, around using data to drive quality improvement and improve the efficiency, the equity and all that in terms of the care. But uh, um, Michael, I just want to change tack a little bit. So I've got a note here that says that you were involved in setting up one of the country's major cardiac centres um, when it was first established at the University of Singapore some decades ago. And uh, we're interested to know kind of what are some of your learnings from back at that time and, and how things have changed in terms of a big, a big sort of centre for heart health. Well, um, I may not look so old, but I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not so young, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I just managed to keep myself in good health. That's it. So in 1989, I, I was the first batch of cardiologists that formed the cardiac department in the National University Hospital. So that 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 is a pretty long time ago. Yeah. So you, you, I think you can more or less guess my age. Yeah. All right. Anyway, um, at that point of time, uh, before that, we were quite fragmented as uh, departments in, um, you know, in, in the, uh, divisions in Department of Medicine. So I think obviously being a department, we could set up a full-fledged service and a cardiothoracic service. And we started doing angiograms, uh, you know, angioplasties. Uh, and also, we were also very, I think, in the opening uh, ceremony today, uh, and yesterday, uh, Professor Kerr mentioned about pain vascular disease. But actually, at that time, we were already thinking about it. So I was actually uh, the one that started the vascular department. So we trained uh, our staff to do vascular scans, uh, we set up the protocols for reporting and all that. So, of course, today the the center is very different from when I first started. It's much bigger, much larger. But, you know, I think at the end of it, the way I look at medicine today, uh, I'm completely in sync with you that the future of medicine is not about doing more stents, uh, not about doing more plasties, bypass surgery. The future of medicine is going to be prevention. And the key reasons are, number one, the advances in imaging are amazing, amazing. I mean, I think it was, there was just quickly mentioned about the photon counting CT. 
Uh, the MRI, for example, today the, with the new um, GPUs and with uh, AI, today I can half the time of the MRI procedure. And not only that, for example, dementia, I can actually measure brain volumes. I can follow them serially to actually reduce the risk of dementia. So, so AI and also the resolution of the MRI is improved with the AI. So what I, what I think is going to happen is that we're going to have prevention. And the other major development is biologics. Biologics, because you see now, a lot of them are using injectables to actually treat problems. And like maybe once in six months, hypertension drug and phase now, and of course, Inclisiran for cholesterol. So that's going to be another trend. So I think the three trends are imaging. Number two, um, as I said, uh, biologics. Uh, and thirdly, of course, AI. But AI, uh, in a real world, unfortunately, most people just know AI, but don't really know AI because AI is not so straightforward. Uh, we are all used as doctors to do clinical trials. So we have a hypothesis, we use that stat statistical analysis, and then we come up with some result, and then we say whatever to conclude. But AI is not. AI, you don't need any hypothesis. You actually just put in data, generates uh, predictions, predictive results for you. But I think not, not enough time to go into details, but I think for people who are interested in AI, they should understand that there are different algorithms, there are different neural networks. And if you use different algorithms and different neural networks, even with the same set of data, you can get different outcomes. So it's very important you, you understand all this when you delve into the AI field. Thank you. Okay. That, I mean, that's amazing. I'm going to pick up on one comment you made, which stands out to me. Uh, music to my ears, the future of medicine is prevention. So I'm going to go back to you, Jasper, and, and, and ask for your comment on that statement, which I think is really profound, um, but very challenging, much more challenging than we might think to cut back and, and, you know, reduce some of these stents and think about preventing things in the first place. So Jasper, question without notice for you. Yeah, no, um, I mean, obviously I fully agree. Uh, it, it is challenging. Um, when you think about primary prevention, it often requires on a ministerial level, collaboration between the Ministry of Health and then Ministry of Finance, because you need to tax stuff. And then it's, uh, you know, usually the Ministry of Economic Affairs. So getting like these kind of regulations in place um, uh, in form of taxes, for example, uh, is often very challenging. So I think that's a big hurdle. Uh, in Singapore, I think we have the luxury of having a whole, um, I, I guess it's not called a ministry, but the HPB, the Health Promotion uh, Board which does uh, a tremendous effort for primary prevention. So, for example, they um, recently have uh, subsidized uh, uh, potassium salts uh, in Singapore. So, like in Singapore, a lot of people, we eat out in hawker centers, these small stalls with food. Um, you know, they started a, a big whole-of-country approach where they're trying to replace their traditional salt with uh, potassium salts, which you know, reduce the risk of hypertension and later on cardiovascular disease. So I think you need a dedicated department uh, or organization to focus on primary prevention. Uh, and I think Singapore in that sense is unique. You'll see it in Japan as well with organized screenings so for secondary prevention. Um, but many countries in the region, I think, are still like in the startup phase for that. But I do think it's the future, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I think it, it's really interesting, the, the diversity and the variability in, in the region. But, you know, the progressiveness as well, I think, is really something that, that other countries can learn from. But, Angela, what would be your thought in terms of, of prevention? And I'm going to challenge you a little bit more in terms of, of scaling that up in, in countries outside Singapore, learning from what Singapore has done. Obviously, there's no answer. So, But um, what are your thoughts on, on sharing wisdom about other countries and scaling up? I think we're going to learn so much just doing a healthier heart SG. Uh, and um, in order to make that a worthwhile investment, I think what should uh, be done in parallel is to have all these feedback systems, evaluation of the strategies um, uh, being shared, uh, whether in print, whether via social media or via community outreach. 
uh, efforts within Singapore and, and outside. So, so I think we really should make use of these opportunities. And, and I, I believe it's not just Singapore. Um, for example, uh, yesterday at, during the oral presentation, I'm aware that in India, they're trying to address, um, you know, household pollution. And some of these strategies are really insightful. And I think if there could be, uh, uh, you know, a platform, a roadmap by the World Heart Federation on, on secondary prevention, some of these things can be put into uh, these documents and then shared across the world. Yeah, I mean, I think that you touched on something else there, the air pollution. What, what's the, you know, we've got the recent report on, on air pollution and CBD coming out from the WHF, but what's, what's things like in Singapore and the re- Asia Pacific region regarding, regarding this? Is it any of you know any of this? Is it tackling any of this in this healthy SG? Healthier. Well, sing- actually, Singapore is quite for- fortunate. We don't have uh, tsunamis, we don't have earthquakes, and we don't have air pollution unless uh, my neighbours burn their forest. Uh, okay. then, but 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 we are on good terms now. So so they've managed that now. So the air quality uh, is good and and no issues. But I just want to very quickly jump yeah. into this point about prevention. L- yesterday. I, I visited a center in one of the community hospitals in China, and I thought they had a very, very interesting model. So they have a center that anyone can walk in without an appointment and get themselves checked at no cost. So who pays for that? Don't know. So the, 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 the hospital pays for that. So, so you could go there and, uh, you it know, get your blood pressure checked. Sure your lipids check, your sugar check, your BMI check, and then they will, you know, interpret that to you. And it's all f- free of charge. So I thought that was very interesting, you know. Is there a big lineup? Uh, no, they tell me that mostly the elderly folks go there. And usually it's the morning that's crowded. By afternoon, it peters off because primarily the older folks go there. But I thought that was a very interesting uh, yeah. concept, very yeah. interesting concept. In Singapore, we do it differently. Um, I mean, we have what we call community screening. So on designated periods, we will tell this particular community, we're going to do this screening for you. Then we'll invite all of them to come down and do their screening. So we don't have something like more permanent, but more as a pop-up, you know, uh, sort of like uh, screening. Yeah. Well, interesting. I went for a walk yesterday to the Disney store and, you know, there's a snake uh, line up to get into the Disney store with a chain. And I thought, well, you know, how come there's a line up there, but not at the heart at the health check uh, hospital? Um, and I, I think just on that, you know, another different area, um, is that, that that's doing very well is this, you know, cardiopulmonary resuscitation kind of public awareness campaigns going on. And you go to an airport in the US and you can practice and learn how to do CPR while you're waiting for your aeroplane. And I think. It's a similar kind of a concept, and I was going to have a go at the at the CPR, but oh, by the time I waited twenty minutes, I gave up because it was so popular. But yes, Jack- no, I just wanted to add something about you know sort of learnings from Singapore. I think what Singapore does very well is to kind of meet people where they're at. So, for example, we have the National Steps Challenge, which was uh, an app that you could count you know your daily steps. It was by the government, and you can get a small prize or coupons if you do a number of uh, uh, steps. And I felt this was really interesting because that concept of coupons works, I think, relatively well in Singapore. I've been working there for eight years. I've been become a, a couponer myself, and a lot of my Singaporean friends uh, do it. I'm originally from Holland. In Holland, this wouldn't work. But this is culturally very appropriate in Singapore, and it's a culturally appropriate incentive. So if anything, what to learn from Singapore is maybe not so much a cookie cutter approach to say we need a, a coupon app and be, you know copy it in countries, but more the way we develop it and the way that you listen and it's grounded in the community and in in like essentially what works locally is something that I think is you know really good to learn from Singapore. And the other thing I think, and this is where we're very lucky in Singapore, is a lot of trust in government. I think people have a lot of trust in the in the government, uh, way more, I would say, than in my native country of Holland. Uh, you saw this during the COVID pandemic because you know, trust in the government affected vaccination rates. It affects enrollment rates, I would argue, in healthy RSGs. So, you know, having a, a government that sort of encourages trust and that people have a good relationship with, I guess, is fundamental for, you know, not just cardiac health, but any type of program that we want to start in vaccinations, but including cardiac health 
Um, so essentially promoting that trust and level of trust between governments and the community, I think is also very, very important. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really nice perspective. And I also like, yeah, I agree. It's not a one size fits all within or between countries. And to assume what's working in Singapore, you can just pick it up and take it to Holland or, uh, you know, or the US or something or China is not going to work necessarily, but we can learn and share and adapt um, and try and see what might work in our local local areas. Did you want to have any questions or? Yeah. If, does anyone uh, want to ask these amazing people who are sharing, I actually think, some really fantastic insights, I think. Anyone brave enough to ask something? Jean-Luc? Yeah, so thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation discussion. I mean, last week, I was at the World Bank for a meeting on sustainable financing of NCDs, and there were two presentations which really impressed me, one from the uh, Philippines and one from Indonesia where both they've been able to structure healthcare system, uh, have taxation on healthy commodities, and build a primary healthcare system, which has some holes, but it's, it's very impressive the way they develop it through technologies and through uh, different mechanisms. So I'm coming from Switzerland, a country where there's very good healthcare system, but we're still discussing whether we should have electronic healthcare records. And I'm wondering to which extent the future of the healthcare will come from Asia. And I'd be interested to hear your views on this. And also, what are the drivers that makes these changes so quick and so efficient in this part of the world? Yeah, good question. And I actually think that's the future. Is you know, so, uh, just to give you the background. So years ago, we I was I was involved in the meetings where they said that we're going to have a national electronic healthcare record. It's called NEHR. That's the short form for it, acronym. So one of the first things I asked my friend who was actually heading this project. I said, how sure are you that we will not be hacked? So, oh, no problem. It was, uh, you know, we've got it, you know, we'll be fine. No, no problem. Then a year later, someone from Sing Health Cluster somehow administratively, some mistakes allowed a hacker to access the system. Access the system. You was this about how long ago? Like no. So ago. one year after that, they announced that we are like invulnerable. Uh, uh, you know, it was accessed by the, uh, you know, through, through, not through the failure of the system, but through failure of someone who accessed the system. All right. And after that, they decided, so they've actually sort of firewalled it now to primarily the, uh, public sector. Okay. So public sector, you're on this record. So initially, it was a whole of Singapore approach. Now, uh, public sector, everybody's on. Private sector, voluntary, you can apply to be on because of these uh, secur security issues. But I think they're trying to encourage people to get on, but they haven't gotten to a state where everybody has to be on. That's number one. Then number two, several years ago, they uh, maybe about seven years ago, the ministry made a very important decision. All the systems that doctors use for healthcare records have to be approved by the Ministry of Health. So all the vendors are approved vendors. So for example, in the public sector, they are making a massive change to revise their system. And then in the private sector, there are few approved vendors which has to meet the standards of the Ministry of Health. So by and large, this will give you the big picture. But I think in the real world practice now, I think in Singapore, everybody is on electronic medical health care record. Every single, whether all the data is in a pool or not, that's a different matter. But everybody is on uh, electro electronic, uh, you know, medical health care record. But, but, you know, there are certain things you have to be very careful. So I asked some, I asked some very uh, intriguing questions. So I said, if I had a VVIP, someone of very high standing, and that's Sean Luke when he comes. Yeah, and saw a GP, and then the GP puts their depression, uh, anxiety, neurosis. Now, what what does that mean? Because it's an impression, but it goes to a lock, which will permanently be there. That's very important. And for that matter, even an ordinary person, if you can put their depression and you put their anxiety. Now, when he goes to apply for a job, 
when he applies for an insurance policy, what does that mean? So they decided then that insurers cannot have access to this record to protect the man in the street. Because if you allow them, then you say, okay, I'm going to add a premium and all that. Uh, so insurers are not allowed. And employers are not allowed to access the record. I mean, obviously, um, uh, the company doctor, when he does assessment, he's actually not supposed to look at, uh, use the past data to make an assessment of the person's suitably, suitability for appointment. But by and large, you can take it that the electronic health record is almost like mandatory. You have to be on it. So that's how the Singapore government does it. <laughs> In Australia, we, we tried to implement a My Health record, but it was, but it was a bit too early and I don't think it was advanced enough and it sort of backfired. And I think that was a real problem. I think it needed to be ready. And then people were skeptical. And I think they probably should have just waited a little bit longer to have things right. Yeah. I mean, just also to add to that, I guess, again, it's a sort of a trust. I mean, I'm from Holland. We have a bit of a similar discussion as in, in Switzerland. Uh, we had a referendum. I think you guys also like referenda. I heard, um, where it got voted down. A referendum to introduce yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was years ago. Same, same reasoning, um, you know, and I think it has to do also, again, with, with trust in the government that they're not going to take your, your data for granted. Um, but I also think it's, it's important to have a, a national discussion about the value. And I can give you an example. You know, I was working clinically in Germany where, you know, it's a very fragmented health system. There's no electronic health records. And we got a patient in the ER, a stack of letters, with their medical history and how easy it is to make a mistake or to miss a prior diagnosis if you have to go through this whole stack of letters on the ER when the patient is laying there with an AMI or a stroke or something else. Um, you know, so there is a benefit, like, you know, having these electronic medical records in a way helps save lives, I would argue. Uh, you know, it's not been quantified to my understanding, but to have a national discussion about the importance of privacy where actually patient safety, uh, which, which affects, I think, everybody. Uh, fundamentally. And that's, I, I think, Singapore does that very well. I mean, I think we need to wrap up. But I think bringing that back to, to Angela's point was we can learn from what's happening with your healthier SG and your healthier heart SG. How can we learn and share those learnings uh, with other countries? So I think we might leave it there and thank Jasper, Michael and Angela and the World Heart Federation for hosting this and uh, having a wonderful chat and congratulations on all you've done and the amazing work that's going on uh, in the region and in Singapore. Thank you.